Today we're going to finish up with the Free Spirit, which is the second division of Beyond Good and Evil. And what Nietzsche has been doing up to this point is to create an image of what the new philosopher might look like in contrast to the old type of philosopher, the dogmatist that he criticizes in the first uh, division of the text on the prejudices of philosophers. Now, he's not just criticizing them because they're old, right? Uh, it's, in some sense, these are the prejudices that have been with philosophy from the very beginning and perhaps will always be with philosophy so long as we are human because they're the mistakes or the errors that we fall into as a result of our human falsification of the world which we nevertheless do as a means to life in order to live in the world. And so the, those within us, within these world enchanting illusions that we've created, who then strike out on their own and try to find the truth, so often end up just reflecting the popular prejudices back to themselves or explaining why the prejudice of their time and place is in fact some sort of universal truth. They don't actually penetrate the bounds of their own worldview and their own presumptions that are not rooted in anything like empirical objective truth, but in value judgments and irrational demands that we have for reality, um, standpoints of usefulness, or what is simply necessary for us in order to think at all, and patterned by things like language, and just all of these things that we end up just recapitulating to the prejudices that we already believe. And Nietzsche, in the free spirit, is suggesting that if we were to follow this path of free spiritedness, push it to its absolute limit, we might be able to, in some sense, bring forth a true philosopher, which is this philosopher of the future. And there is, in these last couple of sections, a very subtle, but it is there, an undertone of the political insofar as he talks about the new philosopher as needing the strength of command, needing independence, and speaking of hardness, intellectual or spiritual hardness, as a key aspect of this new coming philosopher, which he describes as tempters or attempters. In other words, experimenters, true experimenters. And so, you know, this is, of course, the way the description I've just given in some sense is ripe for all sorts of interesting interpretations as to where Nietzsche might contradict himself, or if we want to be charitable, where he is playing with a sort of beautiful paradox, right? Because in some sense, what he's criticized in the idea of dogmatism or moralism are all of these philosophers attempting to impose a new universal objective understanding of truth on the world. And that in even giving his own image of what a truly free-spirited philosophy looks like, that gives way to these true experiments and a true search for knowledge, is yet another variation on that theme. But this is part of the irony, you might call it, that Nietzsche understands, I think, it's very clear from this passage and others, or this section of the work and others, that Nietzsche understands perfectly well that he must wrap himself up in this critique of philosophy and that he's doing the same thing that every other philosopher has done. Is it possible to do it more honestly? Well, in Nietzsche's view, the way to do that would be to make a philosophy of the apparent world where the truth is judged by gradations of what it is that appears most strongly to us. And I would argue that Nietzsche does attempt to do this, but he brings in this concept of the mask that uh, is going to appear throughout Beyond Good and Evil, which is sort of like a capitulation to the notion that human beings do need lies or fictions, or that there ought to be a distinction between the esoteric and the exoteric, as we discussed in the previous episode, and that you might, in some sense, need to make yourself difficult to understand, as Nietzsche says that he intentionally does in a section that we looked at last week, that even in his truer, more honest, more hard form of philosophical inquiry, what comes with that is the knowledge of the value of illusion, and thus a willingness to continue to play in the realm of illusion for whatever that might mean. And so 
without further ado, let's get into the text. We'll look at 38. Nietzsche says, quote, What happened most recently in the broad daylight of modern times in the case of the French Revolution, that gruesome farce which considered closely was quite superfluous, though noble and enthusiastic spectators from all over Europe contemplated it from a distance and interpreted it according to their own indignations and enthusiasms for so long and so passionately that the text finally disappeared under the interpretation. Could happen once more as a noble posterity might misunderstand the whole past and in that way alone make it tolerable to look at. Or rather, isn't this what has happened even now? Haven't we ourselves been this noble posterity? And isn't now precisely the moment when, insofar as we comprehend this, it is all over? End quote. So, this is a political subject, the French Revolution. But it's interesting that Nietzsche, unlike in passages in his middle work where he talks about the French Revolution with some... Uh, passion or partisanship, where he takes a side against the revolutionary spirit, as he calls it. But oftentimes when Nietzsche is talking about the French Revolution, we have to note that he's talking about the interpretations of it. And that, interestingly, one of the things that he says about the French Revolution elsewhere is that it, you know, it has this halo of bloodshed and fire and glory that has misled even you know, the noblest souls as to its meaning. This is the sense in which Nietzsche talks about how it's not a, a cause that hollows uh, any war, but it's a good war that hollows any cause. So the raw physical conflict and combat of the French Revolution, in some sense, I mean, in some sense, whether you approve of it or disapprove of it, it doesn't matter. These interpretations are, as he says, quite superfluous because and the Marxists would agree with this as well, you could say the conflict was in some sense necessary or unavoidable. Um, but then what Nietzsche takes issue with is people who reconstrue the French Revolution as a struggle for liberty, equality, and brotherhood of all men. And this is why he says things like, just comes out and says, I hate Rousseau and the half-truths and idiocies of Rousseau because he was one of the people who adorned the fire and bloodshed and executions and just total out and out war of, of the French Revolution, of the commoners versus the aristocracy, adorned it with all of this moral language and understanding. But the broader point here is this very important line that Nietzsche has emphasized the text finally disappeared under the interpretation. And we just simply might consider how we're incapable of putting ourselves into the mindset of one of the belligerents in the French Revolution because it's a social context alien to anyone alive today. And that we don't really understand on a visceral experiential level that the event itself has passed and now all we have are memories of it and accounts of it and our interpretations of those accounts. And that this is a process of continuous distortion of whatever the meaning of the French Revolution might have been. Um, speaking here of the meaning, the very real imminent meaning of those events to the people who actually lived them and participated in them. That we retrospectively impute all of these things frameworks of thought under the French Revolution, whether from a Marxist lens, we're seeing that as part of the spirit of, you know, the um, American Revolution, the struggle for republicanism and liberalism, or whether we understand that as, you know, uh, the way a conservative would, that this was just simply an outburst of all of the resentful elements in society, taking their revenge against the successful. Uh, I mean, there are just so many interpretations that everyone more or less maps on their current political orientation and the debate that they're currently engaged in and reevaluates this past event according to that. Now, from, you know, the sort of, I guess you could say, the Hegelian standpoint, could the French Revolution prefigure, you know, the socialistic revolutions of Lenin and uh, the Soviet Union and Mao and China, right? Could it be this first coming into awareness of class consciousness manifesting, you know, in Europe. Um, this is where it's important to understand that Nietzsche is not a Hegelian. 
and he doesn't hold to such a view of the French Revolution, that uh, in some sense it is its own event. It is entirely explained by the conditions of the time and the valuations, the competing power structures, the competing will to power, wills to power, I guess that's the proper pluralization, of the relevant uh, you know, groups involved. And in some sense, it's even too much to say that that explains it, because in some very profound way, we don't even need an explanation for the French Revolution. It's so obvious that we don't really need to um, you know, the, the, this war between the plebs and the aristocrats that goes back for all time. Nietzsche sees something not like a dawning or coming into being of a new awareness, but a repetition of the same cycle, which is nevertheless completely individual and distinct and doesn't lead to anything or come from anywhere. So, uh, and this I think follows from a lot of the considerations that we've gone over in the previous uh Aphorism. So let's move on to number 39. Quote, Nobody is very likely to consider a doctrine true merely because it makes people happy or virtuous, except perhaps the lovely idealists who become effusive about the good, the true, and the beautiful, and allow all kinds of motley, clumsy, and benevolent desiderata to swim around in utter confusion in their pond. Happiness and virtue are no arguments. But people like to forget, even sober spirits, that making unhappy and evil are no counter-arguments. Something might be true, while being harmful and dangerous in the highest degree. Indeed, it might be a basic characteristic of existence that those who would know it completely would perish. In which case, the strength of a spirit would be measured according to how much of the truth one could still barely endure, or to put it more clearly, to what degree one would require it to be thinned down, shrouded, sweetened, blunted, falsified, uh, end quote. So I'm going to cut in there. This is, these are some more lines that I think are supremely important to understanding Nietzsche's views, particularly as regards epistemology and the truth. Um, and he's saying something very profound about the entire activity of philosophy here. But let's go back to the beginning where he says, well, nobody will seriously think that a doctrine is true um, simply because it makes us happy or virtuous. Now, it's funny because he says, except for our idealists who will wax poetic about these things. And perhaps the irony there is that you might get the impression, having read up to this point, that the majority of people, at least within philosophy, are just these kinds of idealists. So you're basically saying, well, nobody believes that except the majority of them, <laughs> right? But uh, it's very, he, he has a, the idea of they're letting all this desiderata, this confusion swim around in their pond, this motley bundle of ideas based on what makes them feel happy or what they think will lead to virtue. Now that's particularly interesting, the latter idea, because we can easily sort of ridicule the person who just believes what makes them happy. But when the belief, the accompanying notion to the belief is that it actually will motivate quote unquote good action or allow for society to function. I mean, again, that has nothing to do with the objective truth or falsity of the belief just on the face of it. That's very obvious. And that's why when beliefs are based on these things, pragmatic concerns, utility, uh, or, you know, whatever, whatever irrational demand someone has based on what makes them feel good. That's why these beliefs then sort of swim about in confusion in their pond. I love the metaphor. I like the idea because it reminds me of uh, the way David Lynch would talk about thoughts, that they're like, find, catching a thought is like catching a fish. They, you know, in some sense, they're not, because it, re it recognizes that thoughts that you have or your beliefs or these little sub-personalities within you aren't under your arbitrary control, right? You might have to catch them and they might slip away. They have a mind of their own, so to speak. But I've often remarked this about modern sort of, I don't know what I would say, I guess in the broadest sense, right wing cultural commentary or classical liberal centrist conservative uh, type of cultural analysis um, is that oftentimes they have a lot of very confused, contradictory ideas that they'll express within the same, you know, 
within sentences of one another, they'll express two completely different ideas. They'll uh, be angry about Marxism, but then they'll be talking about the elites and people who have used capital to basically control and coerce their lives and compel them to do things or believe things. But then they'll talk about how these Marxists and lower class people are just resentful at the billionaires and resentful at people who have succeeded better, you know, <laughs> better than they did. And it's like those two ideas don't go together, but it's because it's not based on a coherent, you know, rational anal analysis of what beliefs actually operate consistently with one another. It's based on things like, you know, how often have we heard um, out of the people like Jordan Peterson recently that, you know, without this religious instantiation of value and virtue into our lives, all you have around you is meaningless suffering. And that he's basically expressing, if I don't believe in this religious substrate to my life, uh, it would make me very unhappy about the state of the world and the total amount of suffering in it, because it would be meaningless, you know, and that's just unacceptable to me. I cannot believe that. And, uh, you know, I recently reacted, I think it's just for the patrons to this guy, Andrew Clavin, talking about the state of modern cinema and saying that we've hit the terminal, you know, limit of atheism and that without God, everything just becomes a expression of power. And so you can't tell any meaningful stories without, you know, this religious framework for your, your mindset or your approach to art and storytelling. And, uh, it's, it's just funny because you know, again, he, he doesn't ever think to provide an argument for like a reason based argument for why we ought to believe in God. It's look what would happen if we don't believe in it or things will be so bad if you don't believe in these things. Therefore, we have to believe in them. And so my point, I'm not trying to beat up on this one side of the political aisle, but I hear those types of arguments a lot that, well, society just won't function if we operate on these principles. And I might even say that's an effective rhetorical strategy for arguing, right? Because that that's what people do find persuasive. That's sort of my point in this is that people will just openly say, I'm arguing based on what makes you feel happy and what I think will produce virtue in the populace. And they'll openly say it and people will just ignore that that means they're willing to what is uh, the language the way Kaufman translated? Thin down, shroud, sweeten, blunt, or falsify the truth. They're more than willing to do that because that you don't want the truth in some sense, or at least the majority don't, right? The way you make an idea catch on in the majority is by appealing rhetorically to the fact that it'll make you happy or that it will have a good effect on society if people believe it. And so we're, in some sense, rather openly irrational, and yet we rarely really want to reckon with the consequences of what that might mean. Um, and so then Nietzsche gives us this very straightforward, and I think, you know, it's like cold water thrown on your face, right? That something might be true while being harmful and dangerous in the highest degree. And it might be that the people who are most, because the truth is harmful and dangerous in the highest degree, or that it can be, and that therefore this taking on the sum total of quote unquote, the truth, objective truth without any of your personal feelings about it means an encounter with something dangerous and harmful to you. What's required to know the truth isn't like, you know, the virtues we might normally describe for a truth seeker of like open mindedness and free thinking in the sort of like being uncritical sense. And, um, you know, creativity and all of these things that almost mean nothing in a way, uh, nothing concrete. What you need is hardness in the sense of being able to tolerate things that are uncomfortable, disturbing, that make you happy, or that make you evil is the really the, <laughs> the most terrifying possibility. That a belief could actually be dangerous in the sense that it motivates you to immoral behavior. And you could make that argument about Nietzsche, and people do. And rarely do they stop to look <laughs> that Nietzsche knows this and is aware of that and will say, yeah, I am giving you dangerous ideas. That's the entire point. So uh, let's continue with 39. Quote, but there is no doubt at all 
that the evil and unhappy are more favored when it comes to the discovery of certain parts of truth, and that the probability of their success here is greater, not to speak of the evil who are happy, a species the moralists bury in silence. End quote. So, there are truths you learn through hardship and danger, through being having experience with immorality and personal unhappiness and tragedy. And this is an observation that goes back to the ancients that we talked about. Um, I remember I talked about it with Carl Nord in our conversation on providence. Uh, the idea that, you know, without being put through the crucible of personal hardship and suffering, many of the great geniuses of art and culture would not have um, become who they were. And even more important, the evil people who are happy. So what does that mean? Somebody who does immoral things, but we all have that sense, especially those of us who feel a conscience most strongly within ourselves, that, well, anyone who's evil deep down has a nagging conscience. They know what they're doing is wrong. And aside from psychopaths or completely you know, sociopathic, narcissistic people, uh, immoral people even if they appear to succeed materially, have some sense in which they're unhappy. This is a prejudice, and Nietzsche says that we don't really have an argument for this point. We just, we bury them in silence. We uh, just exclude such types from our mind. Or we just write them off as those are all psychopaths. Um, but, you know, again, given all the considerations we've looked into this past season, you're sort of forced to conclude from any serious read of human history that what we call a psychopath is sort of the norm outside the boundaries of complex civilization. And that since complex civilization is something founded out of the state of nature, founded upon what we are as natural beings, that in some sense, the default state for human beings is psychopathy, at least displayed toward the out group. Right. Um, so, in any case, uh, it, may, it would have been the case, as Nietzsche argues, that there would have been centuries or millennia or tens of thousands of years where there were modern human beings, at least in all physiological or biological senses, who had totally different moral codes t than we do, which we would consider to be cruel or evil, and they didn't have a bad conscience about it. Um, you know, this example has been done to death, but the Spartans, you know, didn't have a bad conscience about infanticide because that was just the norm that they needed to survive with those sorts of external pressures on their civilization. Okay, let's continue and finish out this passage. Quote, perhaps hardness and cunning furnished more favorable conditions for the origin of the strong independent spirit and philosopher than that gentle, fine, conciliatory good-naturedness an art of taking things lightly, which people prize, and prize rightly, in a scholar. Assuming, first of all, that the concept philosopher is not restricted to the philosopher who writes books or makes books of his philosophy. A final trait for the image of the free-spirited philosopher is contributed by Stendhal, whom, considering German taste, I do not want to fail to stress, for he goes against the German taste. And Nietzsche quotes Stendhal here, and I'm just going to read, uh, because... He says it in French, so I'm just going to read this in English, the translation that Kaufman gives. Quote, to be a good philosopher, one must be dry, clear, without illusion. A banker who has made a fortune has one character trait that is needed for making discoveries in philosophy. That is to say, for seeing clearly into what is. End quote. There's a lot to say about that passage, but so what Nietzsche is saying about the German taste the Germans are swept away in this idealistic zeitgeist at the moment. Uh, seeing clearly into what is is not a trait that they, you know, they're more in the tradition of, of Plato, of the philosopher is somebody who sees behind what is and discerns truths about the intelligible world beyond the senses. Whereas it's almost like heretical to most people of a philosophical disposition who tend to be, uh, you know, the kind of people who have not lived their lives in, in pursuit of like pragmatic financial material reward to compare 
the successful philosopher to the successful banker. It's almost intentionally insulting. But Nietzsche's trying to do something really important here by shaking us out of our usual way of thinking about what the philosophical character or the philosophical archetype is like and giving us something that is that heretical, like completely turns it on its head, right? The banker who's made a fortune through his investments, he sees clearly into what is. He has to know the boring, objective, tedious facts and make a distinction between a fact and an idea. Now, you might argue that with Nietzsche, he's called into question what a fact is. But in a very important way, he's grounded what a fact is for us, right? Um, to at least the new coming philosopher that we've, in some sense, discarded this notion of objective universal truth, and we're not even uh, concerned with it anymore. A fact is what most profoundly appears to us in the world from our perspective. And that doesn't mean solipsism, because there is a broader human perspective or a cultural perspective. There are concentric circles of perspective that we can share in, so to speak, uh, according to you know what gives us life or what um, nurtures or expands life and will to power at that given level of our existence. Um, to make things a little more concrete, though, I mean, the first thing he says in that last chunk that I read, hardness and cunning furnish more favorable conditions for the strong independent spirit than the you know conciliatory good nature and act of taking things lightly that people prize and correctly so in a scholar so a scholar is doing something fundamentally different from the philosopher because the scholar exists within the university system he exists within a system of thought that is to say there is just like there's a political overton window of what's acceptable to discuss in the public sphere there's an overton window of which ideas are acceptable within scholarship. And, you know, if you, if you want to get published in peer reviewed journals, you probably know in your given field what that limit is, and that you can't push things too far. And for Nietzsche, the entire act of the philosopher is to push things that far, right to go beyond the Overton window of what is acceptable to pose those questions before yourself you know, first and foremost. Um, so the philosopher, the true philosopher, the new coming type of philosopher who's totally free-spirited is in some sense draws upon the exact opposite characters of the scholar. And it's not, you know, the taking things lightly versus taking things seriously and gravely. The, the new coming philosopher is not like that at all. It's a very good-natured, good-humored affair. It's a gay science, right? But it's there's a gay seriousness about the new philosopher, if that makes sense. Um, and I mean, he really doesn't stress seriousness here. He stresses strength and independence. Um, you know, really, what, what we could say would be not compromising as to expressing and pursuing the truths that are apparent from your perspective and not yielding to the perspective of an academy or the moral rules of the many or anything of that nature, any sort of dogmatism that prescribes the boundaries of your thought before you begin. Um, so we'll move on then to 40 because right after talking about, um, you know, the, the new coming philosopher being hard enough to not need the truth to be blunted or sweetened or falsified, we then go on to this passage in 40 about masks. Quote, Whatever is profound loves masks. What is most profound even hates image and parable. Might not nothing less than the opposite be the proper disguise for the shame of a god? A questionable question. It would be odd if some mystic had not risked something to that effect in his mind. End quote. So, so what is profound loves masks? Profound here meaning deep something again we we should go to the truth uh, of the esoteric versus the exoteric here so the most esoteric the deepest truths the ones that you have to pursue through a long labyrinth of inquiry whatever has that within themselves those truths that have been hard won uh, 
They love masks. And the most profound of those truths you don't even want to convey in an image or parable, because that's often the idea, for example, in religion, that there's no way to convey this with words. We need some sort of metaphor or image by which our brains can even begin to comprehend the truth that's being conveyed here. Nietzsche is suggesting that in some sense, the willingness to hide your truths, to mask them beneath something else, is an indication of that. And a very fascinating remark, might nothing less than the opposite be the proper disguise for the shame of a god. So the most profound type of being, right, would therefore have the most profound type of shame. Uh, I mean, here we might have to think of a god in the terms of the Greeks, Greek Olympians and not so much like Yahweh or Jesus, right? Um, these <laughs> beings that are in some sense like perfected humanity, and yet as they are perfected humanity, they have real personalities and desires and drives and therefore ways in which they act cruelly or ruthlessly or mendaciously or something to that effect. But in a very, I want to abstract from this because it occurs to me that you could actually apply this to Jesus since Nietzsche makes the reference to a mystic risking such an idea in his mind, um, you know, insofar as Jesus is a God that appeared in the world, had a physical appearance and said things and did things, right? Um, you could actually, I think, apply this insight. But what Nietzsche is saying about masking, I want to abstract out from this, is that the most extreme, the limit case of masking, right? The thing that you are most interested in hiding from the world, you, the most, uh, what may be required or the most potent way of, of hiding something, which will thus be required for the very limits of your shame, the thing you wish to hide, will be its opposite. That will be projected. And that that, that is a totally different kind of process than parabolizing something or making it imagistic in the way that some people might understand masking an idea. Oh, we tell it through a parable, so you know, we can be a bit vague and people don't know. No, what Nietzsche is talking about here is quite literally projecting the antithesis, projecting what is the opposite of the true nature or essence of the shame that you're concealing. So let's continue. Quote, there are occurrences of such a delicate nature that one does well to cover them up with some rudeness to conceal them. There are actions of love and extravagant generosity after which nothing is more advisable than to take a stick and give any eyewitness a, th a sound thrashing that would muddle his memory. Some know how to muddle and abuse their own memory in order to have their revenge at least against this only witness. Shame is inventive, end quote. So again, so much psychological richness here that Nietzsche sort of conveys what he's talking about. Occurrences... Um, of such a delicate nature that one does well to cover them up with some rudeness. So that's the sense in which somebody asks or inquires about something that you know <laughs> you're at fault for, and you say, I am insulted you would even ask that, right? And turn it around on them. Suddenly you're on the attack. You're outraged. You're indignant, right? Remember, the indignant are the ones who lie the, the most. I, I had this thought when looking into this is current events this will date the story but there was just that submarine that um with those people who were surveying the titanic and they were crushed to death because the submarine had a flaw and an email exchange leaked where somebody else had expressed um that there were some problems with this sub and that it may not be entirely safe and this was years and years ago and the people who owned it or who were renting it out basically said we've innovated a new design this is the cost of innovation, is that people who don't understand the brilliant things you've done raise all of these fears and problems, but uh, there's no problem. And I frankly take it as an insult whenever it's brought up, right? And of course, there was a problem because the sub imploded and a bunch of people died. But, um, you know, whether he knew that consciously or not, 
his response was to get angry and, you know, use that as a mask for the fact that he perhaps knew there really was a problem. Um, now, you might say, like, Keegan, why are you using this as an example for what Nietzsche is talking about as like a profound person? Uh, this, you know, a petty trick of a dishonest person in order to, you know, put people off the trail of their actual, um, you know, malfeasance in what they were doing, right? But such a moral interpretation of that entire situation, it's not, it doesn't suit us when we are trying to get to the bedrock psychological truths here, which is what Nietzsche is pointing to. He's This paragraph is notably absent of value judgments and is mostly of a nature, it's in the spirit of observation and making observations about human beings. And what, what he says at the end, some know how to muddle and abuse their own memory. And he is, he's just given the example of like, you've done something kind and overwhelmingly generous and you should go and give the only eyewitness a good thrashing. And then he basically later says the only eyewitness is your own memory. So go give your memory a good thrashing. When you've done something, you know, uh, a gesture of love and extravagance, that it uh, might be better to abuse and muddle your own memory as regards to that. Uh, As to why you wouldn't want to remember your own acts of love and extravagance, I think there might be something culturally or personally to Nietzsche here. Because he just says that, you know, it might be that nothing is more advisable than that. Um, he doesn't really give a reason. There, there are reasons we could imagine, right, that we could go through. You know, somebody might have an idea of charity that it is best, that it only matters if it's done without any sort of pride, without needing to take credit for it, and that the memory of oneself as a good and charitable person is a sort of spiritual or moral pride. Maybe it's for that reason. Um, but regardless, right, what he says at the end, shame is inventive. Shame is, it comes from the only witness, which is our own memory. So it comes from within ourselves. And therefore, by abusing and altering one's memory in the sense of, you know, again, the metaphor of beating it with, grab a stick and give it a good thrashing, right? Um, Nietzsche is simply saying there are people who can force their memory to, uh, to see, there's a later epigram on this. Uh, that I think explains the same concept much more elegantly uh, that we're going to cover in this very book, where Nietzsche says, I have done that, says my memory. I could not have done that, says my pride. Eventually, memory yields. That memory is not this objective record of things that have happened to us in the past. Memory is our imaginative reconstruction of things that have happened in the past that is affected retrospectively by information and beliefs that we may have or hold in the future and our changing perspective on past events based on our new conception of who and what we are, given all the things that have happened after that. And that it is possible to misremember either consciously or unconsciously. I mean, here he is talking about consciously though. You can force and abuse your memory until you actually do start to remember things in a different way. Therefore, altering your own inner sense of shame, perhaps. Um, And so what is that? Perhaps it is that masking of making uh, making the opposite the proper disguise for your shame. Um, Okay, so mostly a psychological passage, but has very interesting implications for sort of the truth that is expressed versus the truth that is not expressed or cannot be expressed for whatever reason, moral or personal or otherwise. Okay, uh, continuing with the passage, quote, It is not the worst things that cause the worst shame. There is not only guile behind a mask. There is so much graciousness and cunning. I can imagine that a human being who had to guard something precious and vulnerable might roll through life rude and round as an old green wine cask with heavy hoops. The refinement of his shame would want it that way. A man whose sense of shame has some profundity encounters his destinies and delicate decisions too on paths which few must ever reach and of whose mere existence his closest intimates must not know. His mortal danger is concealed from their eyes and so is his regained sureness of life. 
such a concealed man who instinctively needs speech for silence and for burial in silence, and who is an inexhaustible in his evasion of communication, wants and sees to it that a mask of him roams in his place through the heads and hearts of his friends. And supposing he did not want it, he would still realize some day that in spite of that, a mask of him is there, and that this is well. Every profound spirit needs a mask. Even more, around every profound spirit, a mask is growing continually, owing to the constantly false, namely shallow, interpretation of every word, every step, every sign of life he gives. So, end quote. Uh, and I'm going to read Kaufman's footnote to this section, which I have not always done, but I think it's important here. Kaufman says, quote, This section is obviously of great importance for the student of Nietzsche. It suggests plainly that the surface meaning noted by superficial browsers often masks Nietzsche's real meaning, which in extreme cases may approximate the opposite of what the words might suggest to hasty readers. In this sense, beyond good and evil and will to power, master morality and hardness and cruelty may be masks that elicit reactions quite inappropriate to what lies behind them. Specific examples will be found on later pages, end quote. So what we might notice here is that Kaufman is, this is the standard Kaufman coping mechanism with some of the harshness of Nietzsche's ideas. It's very plain to see that. But he is correct that there are passages, Nietzsche has a, a very interesting uh, literary stylistic habit. He begins a passage with an initial series of observations that you think are going in one direction, and then there's sort of a gentle curve, and then a sudden sort of reversal, where you realize he's about to take things in the exact opposite direction. And in many ways, it's like, this interplay of yin and yang or fire and ice in his writing. I don't know. I don't know if I, I, I can really convey it other than by metaphor. And so I think a charitable reading of Kaufman is that Nietzsche in some ways is willing to use certain words or ideas that he knows will have a strong, we might say emotional, uh, meaning for some people, strong connotative baggage. Um, he can use those to sort of, it's almost like a test in a way. Are you going to be provoked by the most vulgar possible meaning of what I'm saying? Or if you read between the lines, will you be able to, you know, keep going with these observations in spite of the fact that they might be wicked questions to ask? I think Kaufman also, in a way, uh, ignores the psychological uh, nature of this passage. That the spirit of this passage, you know, and the way that Nietzsche is saying psychology is the route to the deepest problems, is descriptive. It's ob observatory of human nature. Nietzsche certainly includes himself. I, I, I'm assuming he would include himself among every profound spirit that needs a mask. But there is an aspect of this where he's saying... In some sense, even though there are people who go around creating an active mask, an active um, persona, because the word persona means mask, right? A, a outward character that they are using to keep their inner contact, uh, content unknown from the rest of the world. And they'll go through their whole lives this way. But even if they didn't, they would have to realize that there was still a mask between them and the outside world. And that to me is very important because what Nietzsche is saying then is not that because he begins with what is profound loves masks and he returns to that idea at the end again. But throughout the middle of the passage, the meat of the passage, it should be clear that it's not just for the profound, that uh, a mask of him roams in his place in the heads and hearts of his friends and supposing he did not want it, he would still realize someday that in spite of that, a mask of him is there and that this is well. That there's not, a, there's a reason, it's the same reason we all have skin, right? Um, and that, not the real reason, quote unquote, but, you know, what's beneath your skin, the musculature and sinews and bones and flesh is rather disgusting, right? Um, the, the skin makes us beautiful by concealing what we really are beneath, our inner workings that we don't really want to see of other people and we don't want them to see it of us. And 
uh, there's a passage from Wanderer and his shadow that somebody posted on the, on the subreddit the other day that was Nietzsche saying that it was a statement of the deepest love for someone to say, I have never wanted to think too deeply about that person, which I would interpret in the vein of Nietzsche psychologizing again, that when you think deeply about another person and penetrate into their inner workings, you see that we are these clever animals that have invented knowledge. That's what human beings are. Still have all of these things that are animal or instinctive about us or that are driving us. And it's not very flattering. It doesn't flatter our vanity to, um, what, what would you say, to expose that about another person, to vivisect them in that way. And beyond this, that there is something so essentially incommunicable about the most individual or particular parts of ourselves, the deepest parts of ourselves, the truths that only we as a singular individual have a right to, that only we know from our singular perspective, that cannot be communicated and will always have to be masked in some way. And remember what masking it actually means. It means a true deception, a true um, uh, not, not just a parable, not just an approximation, right? A opposition between what we show to the world and what's there. And I think to just speak from the standpoint of actual, the psychology as a science, right? As it's developed in the past centuries, there is perhaps some truth to this that people project oftentimes you know, it, like the easiest stereotype would be the person who actually feels vulnerable and feels weak and cowardly, projecting this image of toughness and strength to the rest of the world as a way, the same way that a snake with its uh, bright colors or it's a rattlesnake with its uh, distinctive rattle is saying, don't tread on me, stay away, right? That their strength or their projection of strength is actually a mask for the opposite, which is weakness, Right. So again, that's not a very flattering image that I've just given, but um, this passage is more, I think, far-reaching than simply talking about, you know, how Nietzsche thinks the philosopher of the future should be. It's a, in a way a psychological understanding of this particular tendency that we all have as humans, and that therefore the philosopher of the future cannot escape from and has to be aware of and tangle with in their philosophizing. Okay, I hope that made sense, but I'm not sure. It's a very, this is one of the most notoriously difficult passages, so that's my out for why, if that got a little rambly, I'm sorry. Okay, number 41, Nietzsche says, quote, one has to test oneself to see that one is destined for, destined, excuse me, for independence and command and do it at the right time. One should not dodge one's tests Though they may be the most dangerous game one could play and are tests that are taken in the end before no witness or judge but ourselves. Not to remain stuck to a person, not even the most loved. Every person is a prison, also a nook. Not to remain stuck to a fatherland, and even if it suffers most and needs help most, it is less difficult to sever one's heart from a victorious fatherland. Not to remain stuck to some pity not even for higher men into whose rare torture and helplessness some accident allowed us to look, not to remain stuck to a science, even if it should lure us with the most precious finds that seem to have been saved up precisely for us, not to remain stuck to one's own detachment, to that voluptuous remoteness and strangeness of the bird who flees ever higher to see ever more below him, the danger of the flyer, not to remain stuck to our own virtues and become, as a whole, the victim of some detail in us, such as our hospitality, which is the danger of dangers for superior and rich souls who spend themselves lavishly, almost indifferently, and exaggerate the virtue of generosity into a vice. One must know how to conserve oneself, the hardest test of independence. End quote. Uh, I think this passage is actually in comparison to the sort of the subtleties of the previous passage, rather uh, surface level. I think you can understand most of the words that Nietzsche is saying here. And many of you probably noticed autobiographically when Nietzsche says not to remain stuck to a person for every person is a prison, even the most loved. This is his confession in involuntary and unconscious autobiography or involuntary and unconscious memoir, which he's already told us all philosophy is. And this whole passage in some sense is that, but 
there is something here that Nietzsche, it is his confession of his perspective of who and what he is, but it is a truth at the same time. In a way, this is Nietzsche taking off his mask in the very subsequent passage where he's talking about masks. Um, I mean, you could argue, I guess, if you really want to psychologize Nietzsche, that maybe this is Nietzsche's affirmation of all of this is a mask for his suffering in all of this, right? His inability to find someone that he could share his heart with is his real inner content. And the, his mask for this is to say, I will not be, re, you know, remain stuck to another person. I choose solitude, right? You could interpret Nietzsche in that way. And maybe, maybe you should, given the passage that he just gave us. But I think even with that consideration in mind, what he's conveying here, what we can all take from it and use beyond just an insight into Nietzsche is that it is his truth insofar as these are the ideas that he's been able to shape and put into words to convey to us that has allowed him to live as a being just as Nietzsche is, right? Just as the type of being that he is. That he has seen the way in which true philosophy is that wandering that we talk about in the very second episode of the podcast. And what this passage reminds me of is the wanderer in the gay science in that passage out of the seventh solitude where he cries out that, you know, so often a garden of Armida has tried to detain me, but I could not be detained. Garden of Armida being sort of like the island of the lotus eaters, a return to the Garden of Eden, a this illusory a serene garden created by an enchantress that's like a beautiful dream that he could just go get lost in. It could become this bed to rest on, this placid certainty in pleasure and contentment, almost a sort of negative happiness, an end to strife and struggle in the world and just embracing simplicity and rest. And Nietzsche, in some sense, is saying he was unable to remain stuck to, to remain in, as a garden of Armida, things like science, or even to his own detachment, to that voluptuous remoteness and strangement, uh, and strangeness, excuse me, of the bird who flees ever higher to see ever more below him. So the sort of sense of freedom and perspective from on high that he has given us, he's here admitting that's just one perspective. Don't let that be your your certainty, your certain uh, bed to go lay down on, right? Oh, I've seen the totality now from the whole. I've perceived the truth. I'm now detached from momentary concerns. Now I can rest, right? Um, and not to remain stuck to our own virtues. Uh, and he gives the example of becoming, you know, that there's so many, the way Nietzsche himself describes the truly great uh, teacher or uh, philosopher, or the person of wisdom, right? Is that they want to give of themselves. They want to give their wisdom to the world, just like Zarathustra does at the beginning of Zarathustra's prologue. Um, but he talks about the rich who, uh, you know, those who are superior and rich souls who spend themselves lavishly, almost indifferently. So it's an expression of your power to be able to spend what you have indifferently, to not even care for parting with your wealth because you are so secure in it, you have so much of it that it's like nothing to you. But he says that this can reach a level that you almost turn generosity into a vice. And we don't typically think of generosity like something that can be a vice, but we actually have a very good uh, um, like sort of pop culture psychology term for what Nietzsche is talking about here, which is like love without boundaries is just self-destruction. He's literally saying the exact same thing here in a way that it, there is establishing some boundary, some limit to your virtues, to the things that are good about you is a means of practicing self conservation and knowing to how to conserve yourself is the most difficult part of being an independent soul. And that is the theme throughout this whole passage, being independent, not being dependent on any one of these, you know, another person, or he says, you know, your identification with your country. We might also include 
the university system or the identity one has as being a scholar, not to remain stuck to science or to your idea, your own personal, even your own personal virtues and moral code, all of these things. Um, you should be independent of all of these, recognizing them for what they are. Okay, 42. And uh, from here on out with the free spirit, because we just covered these last three aphorisms in the final episode of season three, I'm not going to read them in full. I'm just going to read a couple excerpts. I actually will read 42 in full, but that's because it's so short. So here we go. Quote, a new species of philosophers is coming up. I venture to baptize them with a name that is not free of danger. As I unriddle them insofar as they allow themselves to be unriddled, for it belongs to their nature to want to remain riddles at some point, these philosophers of the, of the future may have a right, it might also be a wrong, to be called attempters. This name itself is in the end a mere attempt, and if you will, a temptation, end quote. So uh, we always talk about philosophers' rights. When are we going to talk about philosophers' wrongs, right? Um, they have the right to be called attempters. There's a play on words here in German where the word versucher could mean tempters uh, or experimenters. So attempt or experiment uh, is versuch and versuchung is temptation. We typically have, we impute a moral problem with temptation. Temptation has the implication of being that, like some vice or desire you have that is pulling you away from the moral path. Whereas experimenting, at least in our post-scientific you know, revolution world, is, is generally seen as a positive thing. Nietzsche is intermixing these two ideas and pointing to something that a true experiment has something about it which is immoral or by its very nature transgressive because we are attempting... If we're, <laughs> We're tempting to go beyond the established boundaries of what we think we know at the moment. And that every true form of experimentation ought to be a temptation. It ought to point us beyond uh, the boundaries of what we thought we knew or what we thought was right and wrong before we embarked upon this experiment. Assuming it concerns anything we actually give a damn about in the real world, right? Um, I think, for the most part, this passage is fairly clear, but it's... it puts a fine point in it, directly states sort of what Nietzsche has been describing up to this point. That again, it's not a rejection of truth. It's just that they, it belongs to their nature to want to remain riddle at some point, these philosophers of the future. And why is that? All of the concerns that we've brought up with the mask and the perspectival nature of truth and the esoteric and exoteric. These final two sections 43 and 44 just to read a couple highlights in 43 he says are these coming philosophers new friends of truth um he says all philosophers so far have loved their truths but uh quote they will certainly not be dogmatists it must offend their pride also their taste if their truth is supposed to be a truth for every man my judgment is my judgment no one else is easily entitled to it that is what a philosopher of the future may perhaps say to himself. Um, so I think that's fairly straightforward at this point. This is perspectivism. And it offends our pride to want to preach our truth to the many. Uh, Nietzsche, in fact, says in the very next line, one must shed the bad taste of wanting to agree with many. Good is no longer good when one's neighbor mouths it. And how should there be a common good? The term contradicts itself. Whatever can be common always has little value. And Nietzsche is quite correct about that. How can there be a common good? It is a contradiction in terms because what is good is what is exceptional in some sense. The rule is what is bad. Now, one might say that morally speaking, that that's not true. But that is more or less true when it comes to, again, physical reality. Like when we're talking about a good work of craftsmanship, right? It will be more expensive than what you, something that's mass produced and priced for the many to be able to afford it, the most people to be able to afford it, because it is the exception to the rule, right? The best things will be the rarest and most expensive, the most hard to attain. 
right? So, and I'm using, again, the field of economics, but that's because that has to deal with, or that has to do with, um, you know, the material realities of, you know, what people can afford or not afford, um, and so on and so forth. You know, again, as, as philosophers, we should be thinking like bankers who make, <laughs> who can see clearly what is and make the proper investments, right? So, um, the fact that our conception of good in the moral sense completely flies in the face of good in the actual physical sense should tell us something, right? That's, that's good in the actual physical sense is the good of the master morality that Nietzsche would later uh, outline, right? The good is synonymous with the exception. And so Nietzsche is very subtly pointing to the ways in which the master morality store still sort of exists within our brains, within the language that we've inherited from both of these forms of morality. Um, and likewise, the idea of a common good, um, the good as what does belong to the many, and um, you know all of these things, uh, this descends from Christianity and that sort of idea of the, or Platonism, again, as we charted the genealogy from Platonism to Christianity at the very beginning of this text. And that's why I spent so much time on that preface, because it's so important and informative to understanding the whole of the rest of this work. Um, if you, if it clicks with you, those initial ideas that Nietzsche is working off of, which can be rather opaque to people the first time they read the preface to Beyond Good and Evil. So then in 44, Nietzsche says, I mean, he just sort of gives this very long um explanation of what the free spirit is going to be, what this new coming philosopher is going to be. And because I read that entire thing and gave an analysis of it in the finale, I would point you all to there, to there but just to give a brief summary at the end here, that uh, the free spirit is not a free thinker, a freidanker, a libri pensatory, or libre pensures, whatever else these goodly advocates of modern ideas like to call themselves, because the term free thinker or free spirit was often just used to refer to people who have accepted cosmopolitan or modern ideas, or he says uh, the ideas of the levelers, the people who want to make everyone equal, um, the true egalitarians of this era, and equality of rights, sympathy for all who suffers, and the people who take suffering for something that can be abolished. The reason why the free spirit is not like those kinds of people is because, well, I, I will read a little section of this where he says, quote, we opposite men, having opened our eyes and conscience to the question where and how the plant man has so far grown most vigorously to a height, we think that this has happened every time under the opposite conditions. That to this end, the dangerousness of his situation must first grow to the point of enormity, his power of invention and simulation, his spirit, had to develop under prolonged pressure and constraint into refinement and audacity, his life will had to be enhanced into un an unconditional power will. We think that hardness, forcefulness, slavery, danger in the alley and the heart, life in hiding, stoicism, the art of experiment and devilry of every kind, that everything evil, terrible, tyrannical in man, everything in, in him that is kin to beasts of prey and serpents, serves the enhancement of the species man as much as its opposite does. End quote. So this is this is more or less the same point that Nietzsche makes toward the beginning of the gay science. That it is the evil people that have advanced the species man just as much as the good of the herd or the collective morality and sort of shaping us all into these, you know, the, the, the good of the functional society, the good that's directed toward the common utility that wants to make everyone part of the whole and function as part of this harmonious whole, that the exceptional, the immoral, the evil, the experiment, um, what does he say? Other things like, so slavery, forcefulness, hardness, exploitation, domination, these things are the essential character of life and nature that um, still exist within us as animal beings. He says everything that is akin to beasts of prey and the serpent that still exists within our hearts. In comparison to what we might call the improvers of mankind, the people who want to breed out that animal nature, make us self-reflective beings that are entirely reshaped by society and civilization and its needs, making civilization the new environment that we are then placed uh, as faulty within that, right? Because we still have all this 
in us that is animal, that is Dionysian. Nietzsche is simply pointing out the animal aspects of us, he thinks, have improved what we are as a species just as much as this morality of the herd, so to speak. Um, and notice, he doesn't say more so. He says as much as its opposite. And so he says, we are the opposite men. We free spirits. We true free thinkers. The ones who point this out, that under opposite conditions, conditions oppositional to what we typically think of as our well-being or utility, that is where we grow. We are the ones who speak for immorality, suffering, conflict, war. Speak for that as something that makes us better. To understand that as essential conditions of life um, and understand ourselves as living beings. And therefore, to forever be the dissenting voice, the evil voice, the voice willing to raise those strange, wicked, questionable questions against the morality of the herd. And to recognize, therefore, sympathy with all that suffer and attempting to abolish suffering as not only impossible but undesirable. Because if we were to abolish suffering, we might very well abolish happiness by that same token. We might abolish all potential for growth and life to expand and become better. And so that's it's very, uh, these opposite conditions are what we opposite men stand for, the antipodes of everything modern and egalitarian. And so, and then he ends with a very, uh, you know, a very powerful bit of lyric uh, prose poetry in this final paragraph, where he describes the free spirit having been, as one who's a guest in many countries of the spirit. So again, the theme of wandering throughout various um, sort of philosophical geographies. And we are people who cannot be, we have independence against all of these lures to money and avarice and material and ambition or honors of society and so on and so forth. We're grateful instead to all that is, quote, God, devil, sheep, and worm in us. He says, we're curious to a vice. We're investigators to the point of cruelty. Um, so <laughs> curious to a vice, right? Curiosity in the scientific sense might be a virtue, but we take it almost to vicious extremes. We just barely able so that it doesn't destroy us and, and, and impinge on our ability to conserve ourselves, right? We take just as much truth as we can barely handle without being destroyed. And investigators to the point of cruelty, that vivisection that is cruel to mankind and to ourselves and to those around us by exposing what's beneath the skin, which we don't want to often see. And he thinks that we have, the, we free spirits, these new coming philosophers have, quote, foreign back souls into whose ultimate intentions nobody can look so easily, with foreign backgrounds which no foot is likely to explore to the end, end quote. And so again, referring to that, what is masked, what appears of us in the world, the fore soul, right? What is brought into our conscious attention, into the conscious awareness of others as part of our outward persona, and what is only ours in the labyrinth of the breast that can't be expressed. And he ends, uh, what does he say? Quote, Today it is necessary, namely insofar as we are born, sworn, jealous friends of solitude, of our most profound, most midnightly, most midday solitude. That is the type of man we are, we free spirits. And perhaps you have something of this too, you that are coming, you new philosophers. End quote. So, that's the end of uh, second division of the text, the free spirit. Um, it's I recommend going and reading through this whole thing yourself. I don't think it bears a whole lot of philosophical exegesis other than what we've already done in our read through of the text. Although if you want a little more, it's in that final episode, which I'm sure most of you have already listened to. But the end is the uh, reaffirmation of the need of this type of spirit for solitude and the reason for this is clear at this point. That is the way that we nurture our sense of freedom, independence, strength of the soul. That's the only way you're going to get it, is solitude. And I would say both in the physical sense and in the metaphorical sense, or in the sort of in the spiritual sense of standing apart from the ideas of those around you or of the other concentric circles of will to power of which you are a part, the other groups of which you are a part all these ways that your thought can be prescribed upon.
from outside. So this is Nietzsche as existentialist. And I would, you know, argue with anyone who thinks that Nietzsche can be boiled down to just a proto-existentialist and, you know, rule out Nietzsche as proto-postmodernist or any of the other political or philosophical movements that have tried to claim Nietzsche. Oftentimes he does have those elements that they see in him, and that's why they're able to, you know, try and uh, present him as a prefiguration of their ideas. But here, this is Nietzsche at his most existentialist in terms of returning to the pure continental tradition of individual independent thought, what Nietzsche described in the essay Schopenhauer as educator as sort of like the heroic path of the philosopher, the path of Schopenhauer that doesn't depend on, uh, you know, any that goes against the tastes of the current culture, dares to say what does not make people happy or what might be a threat to the public virtue, dares to make those experiments and depends on nothing outside of themselves. Heraclitus is another example. Um, looking within to your own intuition, your own uh, certainties as a starting point, your own perspective as supreme, and the apparent world as supreme. And uh, so with that, uh, part two, free spirit is over, and we're going to uh, have a decent amount of time to get into part three, what is religious? Um, as Kaufman notes, the title of this section is a bit hard to translate, uh, the original German is das religios Wesen. The word Wesen is not easy to translate, Kaufman says. In philosophical, in philosophical prose, it is most often rendered by essence, but in many contexts, being is called for. So it could be like the religious nature or the religious being. I've seen another translation render it as the religious mood, the religious mindset. Kaufman just says, what is religious in terms of I guess he's, he's using the Jeopardy phrasing, uh, putting it not necessarily in the form of the question, but saying, you know, that which is religious is uh, what he's pointing to. But I think translating it as like the religious mindset or the religious state of mind might be good because where does the religious exist outside of the human mind? It's just, he Kaufman's reaching for like a way to reference that abstract thingness that Vesson refers to without, uh, while still rendering it into plain English. So he just calls it what is religious. Now, as to why Nietzsche has chosen to follow up the section entitled The Free Spirit, or the part of the book titled The Free Spirit, with uh, what is religious, is that the way Nietzsche describes the religious mindset or the religious mood is almost like a pathology in this section. He primarily concerns himself with his criticism of Christianity, although, as we'll see when we look at the very first section of this text, Nietzsche's broader project in this section is to, in some sense, survey from above, as from this perspective on high, all of the different sort of religious characters or the spirit of the various religions that mankind has invented for himself. These are, you know, in some sense complex or rarefied expressions of valuations, which have a physiological origin. And we could say that it expresses the physiological reality of the people or group that creates it, such that Christianity is, as he defines it in the Antichrist, like practical sympathy with the weak and the ill-constituted, um, with the suffering, right? It is the, the, its essential nature is a religion of pity, why does such a religion of pity arise? It comes from exhausted, weak people in the physiological sense, right? Um, that it is the decline of life reified into a religion. Perhaps the broader point, though, that I want to sort of make clear before we uh, dive into uh, part three proper is that, so one could say that the you know, uh, there, there's always been religion within humankind to some extent, right? All the way back to the time of totem and taboo or the time of uh, the shamanic traditions, right? In small extended kin groups and tribes. And indeed, if we look at the work of Fustel de Collange, uh, 
that even the more complex, syncretic, uh, you know, systematized pagan religions of the Greeks and Romans and the Indo-Europeans before them seem to have evolved from this very primitive, singular religions of ancestor worship, of family worship, um, that were nevertheless still religions, right? That's sort of the point I'm driving. However primitive they were, uh, couldn't you make the argument there's always been uh, religion? But what Nietzsche is talking about specifically here that is pathological, we have to tie to the figure of the saint or the ascetic. It's asceticism that is in the essence of the religious mindset that Nietzsche is responding to. And while this is not necessarily Christian in, it, in its um, character, it's not necessarily pity-based. Nietzsche thinks that's like the most dangerous and terrible one because it's the religion that's the expression of weakness and declining life. Um, what is religious need not be that, as he does give examples of, for, for example, he talks about the Greek religion in this section, right? Which is the thing, the Dionysian is what he directly opposes to the Christian. So w what is religious does not strictly refer to the Christian, but even among the Greeks and Romans, there is this idea of the priestly class or caste, and the priestly as the ascetic. And this is the sort of neurosis or pathology that has appeared on earth in the form of the religious, is this creation of asceticism. That's its core, its heart. Um, and so with that in mind, Nietzsche explores not only the differences between different religious mindsets, but primarily re returns here to his attack on Christianity. And so without further ado, let's get into it. This is part three, aphorism 45, quote, The human soul and its limits, the range of inner human experiences reached so far, the heights, depths, and distances of these experiences, the whole history of the soul so far, and its as yet unexhausted possibilities. That is the predestined hunting ground for a born psychologist and lover of the great hunt. But how often he has to say to himself in despair, one hunter, alas, only a single one, and look at this huge forest, this primeval forest, and then he wishes he had a few hundred helpers and good, well-trained hounds that he could drive into the history of the human soul to round up his game. In vain, it is proved to him again and again, thoroughly and bitterly, how helpers and hounds for all the things that excite his curiosity cannot be found." What is wrong with sending scholars into new and dangerous hunting grounds where courage, sense, and subtlety in every way are required is that they cease to be of any use precisely where the great hunt, but also the great danger, begins. Precisely there they lose their keen eye and nose. End quote. Beautiful introduction. Um, it's The way Nietzsche it introduces so many of these sections is always brilliant to me because in a way he's like, still managing to sum up what came before in the text while launching us into the next vantage point. And so the criticism of scholars that is reiterated here is the criticism of those who have to follow the moral, metaphysical, or institutional uh, barriers of thought or have to yield to them within society. And just where you need them to most have their keen sense for the truth where you're touching those very moral barriers, that's when things become dangerous because you might be probing truths that could make us unhappy or could promote vice, and that's where they lose their sense for the historical. And so, that to, and to use the great hunt metaphor, you know, that's one of the oldest myths, if not the oldest that we have, and it sources to the Indo-Europeans, although probably branching out from Central Asia, you know, we could say it's like the common ancestor of like most religions have some sort of conception of this great hunt. This, you know, certainly this exists in Germanic paganism. Uh, Odin or Wotan is like the leader of the great hunt where, you know, all these gods and deities streak across the sky, you know, um, hunting down their game in this sort of divine eternalization or immortalization of the struggle for existence, the human condition that we emerged out of, our condition as natural beings, right? This is what the great hunt represents and immortalizes in the divine. And Nietzsche, by bringing this metaphor into his philosophical task, 
is bringing life, nature, into philosophy. And what are they hunting? This vast primeval forest. What is this? It's the continent, the, the demarcated territory of flora and fauna that are sort of like the expanse of the human soul or the human psyche. We remember he said in an earlier passage how the fact that all philosophers um, always return to these predictable uh, metaphysical and moral uh, quandaries and topics is evidence of uh, this fact that sort of philosophy is this kind of atavism, a return to simply the would you say the root conditions or the base conditions that apprehend within every human soul and which have not developed or changed much that philosophy is always concerning itself with the same, you know, continent. It may be vast in its possibilities, but there is a definite character to it insofar as there is a definite nature to us humans as to who and what we are. And when Nietzsche looks back and finds that there have not been any other minds that could join him on this hunt, no helpers or hounds to hunt down the truths that he's looking for. He's once again, pointing out the same criticism of dogmatists. They have been unable to explore what is religious, the physiological basis of what is religious because they have been dogmatists and moralists and idealists or whatever we want to call them. And his search for free spirits and philosophers of the future, his hope for them are people who will go join him on this hunt and thereby uses a mythological religious metaphor in order to describe his foray into the religious mind. So we'll continue, quote, to find out and determine, for example, what kind of a history the problem of science and conscience has so far had in the soul of the hominis religiosi. One might perhaps to be as profound, as wounded, as monstrous as Pascal's intellectual conscience was. And then one would still need that vaulting heaven of bright, malicious spirituality that would be capable of surveying from above, arranging and forcing into formulas the swarm of dangerous and painful experiences. End quote. So the problem of science and conscience is visen and givisen, literally knowledge and conscience. But visen, you know, visen shaft is is uh, you know it's like the, the the craft or the the study, the application of knowledge, right? And that's what means science in the German uh, university. So uh, visen and givisen, uh, science and conscience. Um, we can see how the idea of knowledge and conscience share an etymological root in German. We only have that play on word w words with the word science in English, but it's perhaps fitting, um, right? Because Wiesen knowledge is part of Wissenschaft science. And so Nietzsche is saying a history of how our knowledge has affected or given rise to our conscience or the contents of our conscience, the intuitions of our conscience. And in order to really comprehend that about the religious man, one would need an intellect. It would need to have an intellectual conscience as monstrous as Pascal's. Pascal's a very interesting figure. Um, you know, most of you probably know Pascal through Pascal's wager. Uh, and I, I am planning to, to do an episode on Pascal next season where we'll get into the very interesting ways in which Nietzsche and Pascal are similar, but to just put it in the most general terms for the sake of brevity, they're both uh, existential in the way we were talking about before, right? They both are very concerned with returning to that pure essence of continental philosophy, turning inward and looking at the truths that they can know independently, um, what they can, the certainties that they can find or rely upon um, that are sort of hard won and owned only by them, that they sort of, both Nietzsche and Pascal, turn away from the convenient or the, the handed down explanations of society at large on a sincere quest and seeking of the truth, right? They're both engaged in the same thing. Um, and so Pascal has this intellectual conscience that is um, swollen to a monstrous degree, right? We might say a titanic degree, because you might say that most people in the tradition of believers is content with the handed down inherited stories and morals and metaphysics, but not Pascal. Um, and once again, we have this idea of looking down from above, 
and that having the malicious spirituality that allows you to force things into formulas and arrange the swarm of dangerous and painful experiences. So the mystical experience, the religious experience, the experiences of good or bad conscience, of feeling shame or pride or sin or whatever, um, the deepest, the closest things to our hearts, right? The things that we have probably the hardest time being objective about. It's a sort of, therefore, malicious spirituality, that willingness to find some objectivity with one's own swarm of dangerous experiences and beliefs and so forth. Um, so, finishing out this uh, section, quote, but who would do me the service? Who would have time to wait for such servants? They obviously grow too rarely. They're so improbable in any age. In the end, one has to do everything oneself in order to know a few things oneself. That is, one has a lot to do. But a curiosity of my type remains, after all, the most agreeable of all vices. Sorry, I meant to say, the love of truth has its reward in heaven and even on earth. End quote. That's the end of the passage. So, uh, of course, the irony is that Nietzsche, in wishing for some friends on this journey, cannot ever have them because of the need for solitude in order to... Um, procure those profound truths that can only be found in the labyrinth of one's own breast, right? The truths that are so esoteric, they're only for you. That's really the, the real gems, the honey that Nietzsche is searching for. And there can be no help on that journey. Um, and so that's the, that's what unites Nietzsche and Pascal is that sort of heroic existentialism. And yet neither of them can actually inform the other or really be a helping hand to the other. And notice they come to completely opposite metaphysical and moral orientations as regards, you know, the world and, and the truth. And Nietzsche is very cheeky at the end. And he says, the love of truth has its reward in heaven and even on earth. That's that it comes out of uh, the Bible, this new living philosophy, this new perspectival philosophy is still in its essence a search for the truth it still is philosophy in fact it's the only true philosophy <laughs> while being correspondently apparently anti-philosophical right um anti the old conception of philosophy is just detached uh dispassionate reason um so very interesting things again with opposites um and the opposite as a mask right okay uh, we could say that the the apparent dispassionate detached reason of the old philosophers was their mask for the shame of their own conscious or unconscious knowledge that they were, in fact, motivated living beings. So we'll now move on to 46, where Nietzsche says, quote, The faith demanded and not infrequently attained by original Christianity in the midst of a skeptical and southern free-spirited world that looked back on and still contained a centuries-long fight between philosophical schools, besides the education for tolerance given by the Imperium Romanum. This faith is not that ingenious and bear-like subaltern's faith, with which, say, a Luther or a Cromwell or some other northern barbarian of the spirit clung to his God and to Christianity. It is much closer to the faith of Pascal, which resembles in a gruesome manner a continual suicide of reason, a tough, long-lived, worm-like reason that cannot be killed all at once and with a single stroke, end quote. So worm-like reason, right? It, it regrows and regrows and regrows. Every time you chop it in half, it grows its other half back again. It can't be killed all at once with a single stroke. It continue, therefore, a continual suicide of reason, a continual chopping up or murdering of one's own reason. And what is that? That is Pascal's wager, the acknowledgement that... <laughs> one's faith must rest upon an irrational demand and not upon the pursuit of reason through to its ultimate conclusions or its necessary, its final conclusions. Um, so what is Nietzsche talking about here? He's saying the faith demanded and not infrequently attained by the original Christianity. That's what Pascal's faith is like. The continual murdering of one's own reason is the true character of the original Christian faith, that the Northern Christians have this ingenious and bear-like subaltern's faith, which he compares to Luther and Cromwell. And this is the faith, this Northern Christianity is the faith that thinks you can have faith and reason coexist. 
That's why it's ingenious, it's conniving, it's systematizing, it's the desire for purity to make the faith reasonable, to attack all the ways in which the Catholic Church has failed to live up to its own doctrines, to notice those inconsistencies or contradictions, and to not just be willing to submit and to uh, have the sacrifice of the intellect. We mentioned that co uh, concept earlier in the text. Um, and so this, again, this goes back to that division between Northern and Southern Christianity in Europe, and the, basically the division between Protestantism and Catholicism, which Nietzsche thinks reflects some sort of difference in temperament or character or even national essence between the peoples of Northern Europe and the peoples of Southern Europe. Continuing with the passage, Nietzsche says, quote, from the start, the Christian faith is a sacrifice, a sacrifice of all freedom, all pride, all self-confidence of the spirit, at the same time enslavement and self-mockery, self-mutilation. There is cruelty and religious Phoenicianism in this faith, which is expected of an overripe, multiple, and much spoiled conscience. It presupposes that the subjection of the spirit hurts indescribably, that the whole past and the habits of such a spirit resist the absurdissimum which faith represents to it. Modern men, obtuse to all Christian nomenclature, no longer feel the gruesome superlative that struck a classical taste in the paradoxical formula, God on the cross. Never yet and nowhere has there been an equal boldness and inversion, anything as horrible, questioning, and questionable as this formula. It promised a revaluation of all values of antiquity. End quote. So the reason why the Christian faith is a sacrifice of the intellect so it presupposes that subjection of the spirit hurts indescribably because the entire inclinations and past habits of the spirit resist the absurdity that such a submission to irrational faith um, require of it. So the spirit, geist, intellect, um, it's a real sacrifice, something actually painful to submit to unreason, to submit to a doctrine which may seem beyond, it might, you know, have contradictions or elements which one can only understand through mystical experience or contemplation that goes sort of beyond our rational scientific approach to life. The Southern form of Christianity, which is closer to the original Christianity, so that, it, you know, we can note, he says, from the start, the Christian faith is a sacrifice. That is the <clears throat> sacrifice of the intellect, the continual suicide of reason, this long battle with one's worm-like reason, right? Um, now, modern men, which I think Nietzsche would say, are more out of this like Lutheran uh, revaluation uh, that occurred after the Renaissance and after the you know Protestant Reformation. They no longer feel the gruesome superlative that struck the classical taste in the paradoxical formula, God on the cross. So the sacrifice of a, a god, even, right? A sacrifice of all freedom, pride, all self-confidence, uh, self-mockery, self-mutilation. So Jesus is mocked, he's mutilated, he is this he's a being that's entitled to supreme freedom and pride. He's the all-powerful creator of the universe, and yet he takes human form and becomes subject to death and destruction, and he's killed and sacrificed for the benefit of all mankind. And what's demanded from us in return is the sacrifice of our own intellect, the thing which we take most pride in, the giving of ourselves as a rational spirit, uh, giving that up to our submission to the church, to the doctrines of Christ, to the religion of Christ. The formula of God on the cross, this is what was so powerful that affected that entire revaluation of the ancient world. And the way in which this is, I think <clears throat> one could look to the work of René Girard to explain this, that much of the ancient pagan world is based on this pagan idea of the scapegoat, of casting off your impurities or sins, maybe not sins in the superlative moral sense that Christianity thought of as sin, but sin in the sense of hamartia, missing the mark, that there are all these rites and rituals and sacrifices that one owes the gods in order to appease their wrath. 
And undoubtedly, there are going to be some ways in which you have not adequately sacrificed or carried it out in the proper way. And so very common are these rituals to, you know, uh, cast off the guilt of the community on a sacrificial victim, usually an animal. But uh, Gerard talks about how there are, you know, this could be a, a person and it was there, he, there were traditions of human sacrifice, or even if it wasn't explicitly human sacrifice, the norm of the community was to root out the evil within it, make some element of itself responsible and punish that in order to reestablish this equilibrium of justice with the gods. And that what Jesus is, is the coming into awareness in the Western consciousness of the perspective of the victim of this process, that collective violence against uh, the indiv an individual within the group in order to serve as its scapegoat, to make one individual, one aspect of the group suffer for the benefit of the majority, to carry out these sacrifices with a good conscience so that the community can continue, right? Jesus shifts our focus to not the point of view of the collective doing the sacrificing, but the sacrificial victim, and makes us comprehend for the first time that the victim is innocent and sympathize with, experience pity for the pain of the sacrificial victim by making God, you know, the, the ideal human being, the sacrificial victim. And that this, uh, I believe in the, the language people typically use, short circuits this uh, pagan, you know, uh, cyclical ritual of punishing some aspect of the community, punishing the innocent victim for the sins of the community. So even though Girard is a later writer, I think it's one of the best explanations psychologically of how the idea of the God on the cross affects this revaluation of values in the ancient world. And it's Nietzsche says a gruesome superlative. So it's like this gruesome limit where we see um, supremely the suffering caused to an, to innocence the sinfulness of this very behavior uh, made clear to us, uh, which spurs on this complete revolution in European thought and uh, the Christianization of all Europe. But in the wake of the subaltern's faith of Luther and Cromwell, these northern rational systematizers, these Protestants in their thought, um, Nietzsche sort of alleges that they don't have this we'll say visceral relationship to the faith and this visceral understanding of what the God on the cross means anymore. Perhaps we're too far removed from it now. Perhaps it's become too abstract and logical and that maybe this is responsible in some sense for the death of God in the first place. Uh, Nietzsche then has a very interesting last paragraph here of this little section, quote, it is the Orient, deep Orient. It is the Oriental slave who revenged himself in this way on Rome and its noble and frivolous tolerance on the Roman Catholicity of faith. It has always been not faith, but the freedom from faith, that half-stoical and smiling unconcern with the seriousness of faith that enraged slaves and their masters, against their masters. Enlightenment enrages, for the slave wants the unconditional. He understands only what is tyrannical and morals too. He loves as he hates, without nuance, to the depths, to the point of pain, of sickness, his abundant concealed suffering is enraged against the noble taste that seems to deny suffering. Nor was skepticism concerning suffering at bottom merely a pose of aristocratic morality, the least cause of the origin of the last great slave rebellion which began with the French Revolution. End quote. <clears throat> so then Nietzsche is saying the master morality, the uh, aristocratic morality, um, it's, it's not a pose. They literally do... Uh, deny suffering in some sense or what would we say because Nietzsche would say in other passes, passages uh, that the aristocrat can suffer perhaps even more deeply than the common person but their suffering isn't uh, the kind of moral paroxysm that the slave experiences the, it's not a love or hate their suffering does not represent a hatred of existence as a way of putting it it's not a condemnation of existence without nuance, which is the suffering of the slave. Uh, 
that ultimately as Jesus is the ultimate representative of the slave morality, right? The ultimate oppressed suffering victim, Jesus accordingly denies all of reality and lives imminently within the kingdom of heaven of God. Wants to bring everyone everyone to be not of the world, to turn their back on worldly things and worldly desires and chasing worldly ambitions and pleasures, and to pursue instead the kingdom of heaven. And so we might think of Marie Antoinette, let them eat cake, right? The or the um there's that that meme from Arrested Development where uh I forget her name, uh Jessica Walter's character is like, it's just a banana, Michael. What could it cost? Ten dollars? Right? The complete <laughs> disconnection of the upper classes from the actual reality of the suffering of the lower classes. And the fact that in Nietzsche's view, such truly aristocratic people that sort of have like these opposite valuations where they're always looking for a conflict. They're always looking for some way to impose discipline or suffering on themselves because they live in such total freedom. And so they don't understand the, you know, the hatred and the condemnatory nature of the, the suffering of the lower classes that condemns reality on account of their suffering. Um, the, the remarks that it's the Orient that revenged itself on Rome and the Roman Catholicity of faith. <clears throat> um, I have to confess, I'm not exactly sure I understand that remark, except that insofar as the, he's saying the Oriental slave, Rome took in slaves from all over the world, all over the, the world to the Romans, the immediate Mediterranean world, including slaves from the ancient Near East, which we could say uh, Nietzsche is stereotyping, admittedly, as being more metaphysical and not Catholic in the sense of the Catholicity of the Romans is, it's, it's the tolerance of the Imperium Romanum that he spoke of earlier. The, the very fact that Rome takes in so many different religious viewpoints and perspectives from all over the world and becomes this cosmopolitan empire allows for this kind of tolerance of different perspectives that is anathema to a Gnostic, for example. Someone who basically believes that there is actually a universal truth behind all reality, uh, that all of the sensory world is an illusion, and therefore all these different bickering perspectives are just different modes of ignorance to be rejected. What Nietzsche sees in the slave morality, um, it's a core aspect of it, is this universalist dogmatism, this seriousness and spirit of gravity about its morality, this conviction in the rightness of their conception of the good and the rejection of the tolerance of opposing perspectives and the rejection of the idea, for example, of the happiness of the evil person which is really, again, what we're talking about with like somebody like Marie Antoinette, that she might actually not have any malicious feelings toward you. And uh, you might be an afterthought if you're thought of at all, which is what Nietzsche sort of alleges that the self-directed nature of the aristocratic morality is. The slave misunderstands this and treats everything with this, the, the purity of a Lutheran, right? Hatred or love to the extreme, to the point of, of sickness, making oneself sick. Um, and we can see this, it's like, again, the kind of hyper accentuation of an inner state to the point of this kind of monstrous voluptuousness. What Nietzsche is getting at throughout this entire passage, even though he kind of meanders in some ways and makes some statements which may not seem entirely relevant to us today, what he's describing is, again, he's trying to get at what is the state, what is the nature of this religious state of mind? And he gets at it here at the end with what he's always called that slave revolt in morality, the slave revolt in religion that comes in the form of Jesus and Christianity, this unconditional worldview and unconditional morality, and this, therefore, moral certainty and condemnation of those who don't uh, correspond to it and certainty that they know what they're doing and have a bad conscience about it, and they're doing it out of malice. All of these, these, these are the pathology of religion, particularly the Christian religion in this case. Okay, so I think we're going to call it here.
Um, I was thinking about getting into 47, but I think it would be better to read 47 at the beginning of the next uh, section of the read-through. Um, because it'll be a nice like recapitulation to everything we've talked about. So even though I'm not intending to <laughs> follow this pattern like I did with the last section, where we read two sections from the beginning of the, uh, the next uh, division of the text at the end of the episode, that's what we've ended up doing again, because we're just sort of at a natural stopping place. Um, and I think we've introduced the ideas of the section, what is religious, uh, pretty well. And, uh, yeah, it will be next time. I think we can cover the bulk of this section, if not all of it. I think we'll probably cover the rest of it in the next episode, but, um, I think that'll do for today. So thank you everyone for joining me. Um, I'm excited. We're going to, I'm going to be leaving on tour in the next couple weeks, um, I'll have updates about that on the podcast, um, and I've got, I'm going to be publishing the Q&A that I did with the patrons uh, as well, so a lot of extra stuff and a lot of cool uh, interviews that I'm planning and uh, I'm going to be working on in the coming weeks before I leave, and I think, you know, this is going to run, this Beyond Good and Evil book club, it's going to run a little longer than the Birth of Tragedy one did, but not that much longer. I'm not exactly sure how many total episodes we're going to do, but um, I think we're doing a good job of covering the text comprehensively while still um, moving at a pretty decent pace so far. So with all that being said, uh, thank you everyone for joining me. Let me know in the comments uh, what you think of this episode. Spotify is really pushing the interaction aspect. And uh, All right, everyone have a great Tuesday. Signing off. If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections. The link is in the description. Or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media. Thank you for your support.